shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine fill Good morning and welcome to Let the Bible Speak. My name is Alex Meredith. I'm the minister for the Marquette Church of Christ. Thank you so much for joining us on the program today. Uh, we just wrapped up our series in the book of Philippians. And due to the schedule in the upcoming months, Brian Poe, uh, the new minister with the Escanaba Church of Christ, alongside Dave Grant, who has uh, since retired from that position, uh, they're going to be joining us on the show here sometime in the next few weeks. And so until that point, I have a little bit of a gap here, not enough time for a full series. But what I thought I'd do is I'm going to get into a few lessons from a larger series that I did here at the Marquette Church. And I'd like to share some of those lessons with you. And the series was over First and Second Peter. And so today, we're actually going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 25. We're not going to get there, uh, we're not going to read from that quite yet, uh, but that's where we'll be in a minute. I, w I want to start today, actually, by telling you about some, uh, some Roman history. Gaius Julius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, also known by his moniker Caligula, was the emperor of Rome from the year 37 to the year 41 AD, which is shortly after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, this is shortly after the formation of the early church. So this is the emperor in charge in Rome during those formative years when the church is just starting to, to break out and spread like wildfire, right? So with Caligula, you know, the first several months of his reign were relatively peaceful. He garnered a lot of public support and favor. But then there was a moment, I think seven months into his reign, where he suspected that he had been poisoned. And he began growing very bitter and very suspicious of all the people around him. Uh, started pushing them away. By the year 40 AD, just three years later, he began referring to himself as a god, appearing in these public venues dressed as Hercules uh, and Apollo. He began addressing himself in official public documents as Jupiter, which is kind of interesting. Uh, there are all of these statues of various gods and goddesses that are part of the Greek pantheon, laying around Rome, and he actually had the heads of these statues chopped off, broken off, whatever, and he had the statue heads remade into his likeness. So it was his face with the body of Hercules, his face with the body of Apollo, or, and things like that. And he did that with all these statues all around the city of Rome. Um, he wanted to be worshipped as the Neos Helios, the, the new sun, and he occasionally would force the public to worship him as such. Uh, in his later years, he was well known for his cruelty, his extravagance, his uh, sexual deviancy. He just was pretty corrupt and terrible ruler all around. You have Emperor Claudius, who came to power in 41 AD following the assassination of Caligula. Uh, he, see, the thing with Claudius was that he was, he actually had a moderate physical handicap to him. I think it was his legs. He, he couldn't walk and he certainly couldn't run very well at all. And so he wasn't able to join the military himself and he wasn't very well respected because of it. Uh, a lot of people looked down on him because of this handicap and he struggled to gain the confidence of the public and even the Senate and the military. And so what he did was he pretty openly just offered bribes to people to garner support. 
And it was pretty well known that he did this. And he didn't believe himself to be a god, but he was very instrumental in reviving and enforcing the worship of various gods and goddesses that were part of the traditional Roman pantheon. Uh, Nero, his reign spans from 54 to 68 AD, a pretty long time, at least for a Roman emperor at that period. Uh, and this actually covers the period of time of the writing of 1 Peter, the text that we're going to be reading today. Um, so Nero was known to be incredibly corrupt. It's believed, actually, that during his reign, he more than likely had his own mother, his own wife, and his own stepbrother uh, murdered on separate occasions for his own personal pursuits, whatever those were. Uh, this is one of my favorite stories in Roman history. <laughs> He participated in the Olympic Games in the year 67 AD. And the Olympics were actually supposed to be held in 66 AD, but he was away doing something else, and so he had the officials postpone it so that he could participate. And he participated in 67 AD, and he won every single event. Um, what's hilarious about that, too, is that there are reports, like there's written record of him you know, in these chariot races, falling off the chariots. And like, he wasn't very good at a lot of this, but he won every event. <laughs> so just the, the perfect symbol of just how corrupt his empire really was. It's believed that Nero was the one who started the great fire of Rome that destroyed about two thirds of the city. Uh, and then, and he did this probably to make room for his infrastructural pursuits. And then funny enough, he kind of oddly blamed Christians for the fire after the fact, uh, even going so far as to burn them alive as punishment. Uh, after the fire, he was notorious for torturing and executing Christians, uh, likely due to their perceived threat to the Roman religion. According to a man named Eusebius, writing around 300 AD, so this is him writing well after, but he claims that Nero is responsible for beheading Paul and crucifying Peter, which we don't really know what happened to Paul in the end, at the end of Acts 28. We just know that he's in Rome awaiting, to, uh, awaiting the chance to appear before the Caesar. Uh, and then Peter, you know, in John 21, actually Jesus makes the remark to Peter that when you were young, you once went where you wanted did what you wanted to, addressed yourself. When you are old, you will be taken to a place where you do not want to go with your arms outstretched. And John makes a little narrator's note in there that says this was to tell what kind of death Peter was to die, which seems to suggest Peter may very well have been crucified. Some people believe upside down as well. Vespasian seized power. In the year 68 AD, he revived something known as the emperor cult, which forced all Roman residents to recognize the, uh, the emperor's supreme divinity. Uh, he made them perform these acts of, worships, uh, acts of worship and make these tributary payments uh, in light of this claim to divinity. Emperor Domitian later fully embraced this concept by referring to himself as Dominus et Deus, which means master and God. Uh, so, the point that I'm trying to make with all of this and the reason that I'm going into such, such tremendous detail is because I want you to see that this relationship between Christians and the state, Christians and their government, that has been a point of contention from the very beginning of the formation of the church. It's been an issue from the beginning. Uh, and it's a really important issue, right? Especially considering the fact that, at least in the early years, prior to the years of Constantine and all of that, Rome was really in direct opposition by their laws, by their religion, by their morality. All of these things stood in absolute and direct opposition to everything that Christianity was and is. Right? So... They often punish those, by the way, that refuse to comply with uh, their standard of religion and morals and all of that. 
So, so it's always been a point of contention. And it's in the midst of this battle between church and state that Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 2, has some really surprising advice. So listen to this. This is 1 Peter 2. We're going to read verses 13 through 25. It reads, Be subject to the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if you suffer and, excuse me, but if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So you have this really powerful call to submission, right? Which I think is very pertinent in a world and specifically in a country that values freedom as the pinnacle of human virtue, right? I mean, freedom is, that's all that we could ever hope to achieve, right? Freedom. And here Peter is saying, submit to the authorities. It's fascinating. See, back in chapter 2, verse 11, and I know we didn't read this, but back in chapter 2, verse 11, Peter makes the remark that Christians are, quote, sojourners and exiles in the world. Sojourners and exiles, right? It's this idea that this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through, right? Someday I'll fly away back home and I'll I'll reach a destination, I'll be where I'm supposed to be, but right now I'm in a foreign land, I'm an exile, right? And you might get the impression that because we are exiles, we then don't really have anything to do with the material world. We don't really need to interact with it because it's, it's not our world, right? We're, we're just heavenly citizens. But we're also, also earthly citizens, in fact, it's in John chapter 17, verse 15, Jesus is praying for his disciples, and he says something really fascinating, fascinating in this prayer. He says, praying to the Father, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. God's prayer is not that we would necessarily, at least immediately, be removed from the world and the suffering in it. God's desire is that we're kept from sin more than anything until that day when Jesus returns and the world is put to rights and evil is taken care of once and for all. But until then, we're in the world. We're a part of it. We are heavenly citizens, but we also have a duty and responsibility to the world. We're not of the world, but we're still in the world. Right? And that entails with it certain responsibilities. So he starts in talking about this responsibility. He starts with this plea, this exhortation to submit to human government. He says in verses 13 and 14, be subject to the Lord's sake to every human institution. He talks about the emperor. He talks about governors. Um, and this plea to submit to authority, by the way, is justified by the fact that God is in charge of, and he, in fact, is the one who establishes all these government systems. 
So, you go to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Uh, Paul, in writing to the Romans, who obviously were right at the center of all of this, in Romans 13, he says in Romans 13, 1, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So all of the world leaders, anyone you can think of, has been placed there by God himself. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Because that creates a whole different dynamic for how we as Christians relate to those government bodies. In Psalm chapter 2 even, there's this uh, fascinating psalm, why do the nations rage? Why do the people's plot in vain. And it talks about the kings of the earth and all the things they try to plan and do. And it, there's a line in there that says, and God derides them. He laughs at them. He laughs at the fact that the kings of earth think that they are the ones in charge. Because in reality, God is the one who put them there. And God is the one who reigns supremely, Right? But they do have a degree of authority on earth that's been given to them by God. And that's why, by the way, in Romans 13, 2, it goes on to explain that actually defiance to these governing authorities, when it is proper, and we'll get to that in a second, defiance to these, uh, to these authorities, excuse me, my words are hard to come by this morning, apparently. Uh, defiance to these authorities could be seen as synonymous as... Uh, Rejection of God. Romans 13, 2. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. That's why, by the way, back in 2 Peter, or sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, in verse 17, at the end of that verse, it has that pairing there fear God, honor the emperor. There's a reason those are next to each other, because they're related. Your fear of God and your obedience to God is demonstrated and displayed in part by your obedience to the authorities which God has put over you in the world. Now, all of this is assuming that these earthly leaders fulfill their God-given responsibility to, as it says in verse 14, punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. Is that what earthly leaders always do? Certainly not. And you might could say that while God gives them this duty, this responsibility to, what does it say, punish the evil and praise the good, that commission is not always fulfilled. God gives them the freedom, just like he gives us the freedom to obey or to disobey. We know that there are bad leaders out there. We know that this is not always true. We know that uh, there are ungodly leaders everywhere in every human institution who abuse their God-given authority. There are bad presidents, bad prime ministers, bad kings, bad senators, bad representatives, governors, IRS agents, mayors, city council members, school administrators, employers, uh, department heads, landlords, and the list could go on, right? There are ungodly leaders everywhere. And here's the thing, though. This is what's really surprising. Peter's message, knowing that this is true, knowing that there are people like Caligula, knowing that there are people like Nero, knowing that there are people like that that are going to be in charge in the world, do you know his message? Do you know what he says? Verse 18, submit anyway. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the unjust. And by the way, no, verse 18 has nothing to do with slavery. I know it uses the word servants, uh, but that servant language is actually recalling the language that uh, he used back in verse 16 when he referred to all Christians as servants of God. And so now he's saying, essentially, Christians, be subject to all of these people who are in authority over you, whoever that is. Even, 
if they're not such a great leader? Now, of course, we come down to the critical question. Does that mean that we should obey everything blindly? Does that mean that we should obey no matter what, no matter what we are asked to do? No, definitely not. The Bible is full of examples of civil, diso of civil disobedience when the civil powers that be defy the will of God. I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Three young Hebrew men who were exiles in the nation of Babylon. They were Israelites. They were Hebrews. Taken away, whisked away from their land, now growing up in this foreign land. And they're actually training in the king's court to be servants in, in the king's court. And King Nebuchadnezzar sets up this large statue in the city. And he says, and he makes this decree that any time the horns and the lyre and the harps, when, when those play, I want everybody in the city to bow down before this statue in worship. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to do so. Somebody tells on them and brings them before Nebuchadnezzar. He says, are you sure? Because if you don't do this, I'm going to throw you into this fiery furnace, by the way. They refuse. They say, we bow to nobody but God. And so he throws them in there. And it's kind of a fascinating story. This fourth figure appears in there, appearing like one of the sons of God, Nebuchadnezzar says. And uh, they come out of the fire unscathed even though it had killed some of the men of Nebuchadnezzar who weren't even in the fire. They were just near it. It was so hot, it had killed them. But these men were thrown into it, and they were untouched. And so you have instances in Scripture of what you might call civil disobedience. But there are two things to note about that. One is the civil disobedience only happens when... There's a direct uh, conflict with the will of God. And that civil disobedience only extends insofar as it's necessary to obey God. Right? I, I hope that makes sense there. So it's not just, well, I'm unhappy with my leader and he put out this legislation that I'm not too crazy about, so I'm not going to listen. It's not that. It's... If the leader is telling you to do something that will defy God's will, don't do that. It's sort of the situation where, you know, if you're working in a job and you have a, an assistant manager say, well, I want you to do it this way. You say, well, the manager told me to do it this way. Well, who should you listen to? Probably the one that's really in charge, right? And the kings aren't ultimately in charge. God is in charge. He's the one who put them there, right? So something to keep in mind, but ultimately you do have this, uh, this call to submission so far as we're able to submit and obey the will of God. And you might ask, well, why submit? Why take this posture of submission in the first place? And ultimately it's because that's what Jesus did. You go to verses 21 through 23, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. And then it describes he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Right? Jesus took on this posture of submission. And so for Peter, he considered it a privilege to walk, or sorry, to suffer unjustly and to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, even if that led him to the foot of the cross. I wonder if Peter was joyful when he was being led to the cross because he, he recognized that he was participating in the, in the life of Christ in some way. That's an interesting idea of freedom, by the way. In verse 16, at the very beginning of that verse, you have this statement, live as people who are free, which is a fascinating thing to say to people to whom you are saying, submit to all human institutions. What do you make of that? Well, maybe the point is that the embodiment of freedom, true freedom, is being free to choose whatever we want, but then choosing to submit, serve, and suffer. 
That's why in verse 16, if you continue reading, it says, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants for God. We use our freedom as an opportunity to serve the people around us. That's the only way to overcome evil, by the way. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. All right. More evil certainly isn't a solution. All that does is make you the tyrant that now needs to be stopped. And what was the result of Jesus' submission? He himself bore our sins and his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Good things happen when you serve one another, when you submit to one another. I think this, this whole message of submission is so important in a country full of political discontentment, right? As far as you are able to submit, be content with what you've been given, and do your best to live faithfully in the circumstances in which God has placed you. So I thought, I thought for a little while about why else this matters to us practically, and the best that I could come up with is that none of us like to be told what to do. Especially if you're like me and you really like control, it's hard to wave the white, to wave the white flag sometimes, but sometimes that's exactly what we need to do. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 actually makes the remark, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit. I hope you've been encouraged and uh, challenged by the lesson today. Maybe you would like to learn how you can submit to God and don't know where to start with that. Before we wrap up, I want to tell you about some of the resources that we have to offer you. First of all, I'll tell you about our Bible Correspondence course. We have a seven-part workbook series published by the World Bible School that walks you through the study of Scripture to understand the fundamentals. Uh, if you're new to Scripture, this might be a good way to get started in that. And if you're going to do that and you don't have a Bible or don't have a Bible anyway, we also offer those to you totally free of charge. Just let us know that you would like one. The contact information is up on the screen as well. You can reach us by mail, the Marquette Church of Christ, P.O. Box 372. That's in Marquette, Michigan at 49855. You can also find a lot of this info at letthebiblespeak.net. You can also listen to our podcast, Let the Bible Speak UP. You can find that on Spotify and Podbean by searching that name. Also, before we go, I want to tell you about an event that we have coming up titled It Is Well. That's on Saturday, June 10th. I want to invite all of you to join us at the Marquette Church of Christ. That's at 1104 West Fair Avenue here in Marquette. It's going to be from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, we've got a special guest that's going to actually come on a show here as well. He's going to conduct that workshop. So I want to invite all of you to that. Again, that's Saturday, June 10th. I want to thank you all so much for joining me on the program today. We'll continue with these lessons in First and Second Peter next week. In the meantime, may God bless you. Have a wonderful week.